welcome everyone to the 2018 ProManus Investor Summit. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Brad McFarlane. I'm the vice president here at ProManus. Um, this 2018 event is the fourth event, I believe. We talked about this today. I think it's the fourth of Investor Summit event that we've, we've put on, and it's, it's an exciting thing for us um, to just to share insight with current and potential investors on projects we have going on, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, what we think about real estate investing at any given time. Um, so thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. It's actually even more special for us this year because we get to have this event in a almost constructed brand new office building, which Rachel and Lisa and the rest of the team put together. I think they did a great job pulling this off. So thank you to you guys for doing that. Looks great. <clears throat> Before I forget, if you could just switch your cell phone to vibrate or maybe turn it off altogether, whatever works for you, that would be perfect. And um, in the spirit of efficiency, I want to go ahead and introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. John Bogdasarian. When you inevitably get frustrated with someone, remember the question to ask yourself is not, what's wrong with this person? But rather, what does this irritation tell me about myself? This question, the pause, then the reversal in thought, goes back to Epictetus, <clears throat> who said that we are complicit in the offense anytime someone hurts our feelings, annoys us, or makes us upset. We are choosing to react to something. We have to remember that. We have to remember that we have the power not them, that it's not the things they do that upset us or offend us, but our judgment about those things. The irritant is never the other person. It's always something within you. So if I irritate you tonight, or if I annoy you, <laughs> just remember, it's not me, it's you. <clears throat> I want to say, you know, thanks for coming. I, I know we get, we have a lot of investors now from out of town that can't make it, and so we record this, and, 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 and thank you for watching it if you watch this, and, and I can't see any of you, so I'm pretending to look at you, but these lights are pretty bright. So, um, but you coming and, and, and listening and participating and investing money with us means way more than you could ever possibly imagine. I, I, I spend pretty much every night the week before this event every year reflecting upon what this means and it's not really about the life we get to live or the the activity of 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 building things and 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 seeing projects to completion that is so exciting about it it's it's really more a validation of 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 our life and our life purpose and and what we all do the entire team and everyone feels that way so Thank you, we greatly appreciate it. We appreciate you coming. And um, tonight what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna very quickly update you on all our current projects, what's going on. We're gonna go through it pretty fast. Don't worry if you don't understand it. I'll have a simple summary at the end that's pretty much all you really need to know. And then um, we'll hopefully leave plenty of time for question and answers if anybody has any questions. And uh, after that, as you can tell, this year we've decided to try and start turning this an event, this event, I should say, into a great way to use pre-tax dollars to throw a fun party. So I know a lot of my friends are showing up later. You're <laughs> welcome to stay and meet them. Um, that may not build your confidence in what we do, but um, anyway. So onward. Um, PF3, most of you are familiar with the story of PF3 by now. Um, if you're not, we acquire solid properties below replacement cost. This has been closed to new investment for a while now. Uh, there are really no good opportunities to add to it that we have found. And it's doing exactly what we set out to do. It provides consistent cash distribution. Um, we're constantly reducing debt. We're spending a lot of money back into our properties. and improving them all the time, trying to increase occupancy and, and maintain them. Um, the results of PF3 year over year, uh, if you look at the third line, the net operating income, that's probably the most important line that's increasing. Um, one key thing in 2017 you might notice is that 
the taxable income line at the bottom has actually decreased, and this is in large part to the new tax law and uh, that took effect for the fourth quarter of last year, and I will explain the benefits of that to all of us briefly a little later. But um, as you'll note, on the line underneath the net operating income, the depreciation and amortization expense, that number is a million dollars higher, uh, in large part, again, due to some tenant improvements and leasing commissions and capital expenditures we had to make, but in addition, the ability to expense those items in the year as opposed to capitalizing them and depreciating them over time, and again, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, you'll see a small loss on sale. That was due to the sale of a remnant property we had in GR4, small medical office building. Um, the rest of that portfolio we had gains on. It was just a question of how we had allocated things, so um, no big change there. So while our net operating income went up, taxable income went down. That's good. That means you get to keep more of your money. Um, I think if you look at the next slide, you'll see our distribution history. And as we go through this, in the first few years, we were distributing on an annual basis, increasing amounts of cash, in large part because we were buying more properties and we had more equity that we were managing and more properties. In 2017, you will see that for the first time, we didn't distribute as much cash as in the previous year. And again, that was in large part due to the tax changes. It's not that we didn't make that money, it's just we didn't distribute it out because we're, again, reinvesting the excess reserves <clears throat> into our properties. So since inception, PF3 is distributed out at least 7.5% annually. Um, most years it's been much higher than that due to some bonus distributions and we've had share price increases so a current uh, investor is getting distributions based on essentially a higher valuation, which equates to slightly better than 9% in yield. Um, good results, we think. And now, let's get into a little bit of a complicated slide for a second, um, but I am gonna try and keep this simple. This is important to all of you for a number of reasons. Um, the new Tax Cut and Jobs Act, which took place, it retroacted back to the fourth quarter of last year, which is why we um, had some benefit to last year. It expands bonus depreciation. And an example of that, as you see up there, is a $780,000 roof replacement. And believe me, we have a lot of roofs that will cost us at least $780,000 to replace, some that will cost us more. Previously, if we spent that cash to replace that roof, we would have to depreciate that roof over 39 years. So we could only deduct $20,000 a year. So you can see the problem because we collect all this rent and we wanna pay out the distributions, but we have to pay out $780,000 for a roof, yet on the taxes, we can only show that, that we spent $20,000 essentially is how that looks for tax purposes. Now we spend that $780,000 that is fully deductible in the year we spend it so your tax liability as a member in the LLC is gonna be substantially less. If you don't follow that logic, this is Eric McClelland, he's our CFO, and he'll be here all night. Um, there's also a new pass-through deduction. Um, this actually goes to your capital account, which is another kind of absurd benefit um, if you come from the Democratic side of the equation. If you're a Republican, you'd love this. But um, if you invest $100,000 and you generate $12,000 in taxable income on that, which would be a high return in terms of taxable income after depreciation and all these things you can, you can utilize, actually, because of the depreciation, your taxable income under this example will probably be closer to $6,000, not 12. However, um, let's use the 12. Your new deduction is equal to 2.5% of your basis, so you could actually say instead of having $12,000 of taxable income, you have $9,500 in taxable income, and that reduces that by 20%. Now, because of the depreciation that I talked about, the first benefit, again, that $2,500 is probably going to come off a number more like $6,000. So instead of paying taxes on $6,000, you're gonna pay taxes on 3,500. 
as a percentage. That's a much higher amount of savings that you're getting. So you combine these things together and you come up with really a situation where going forward investing in real estate ventures like we have, your tax liability will shrink substantially. Um, we don't focus our deals based on how to take advantage of the situation. This is just something that has dropped in our lap. It's good for us, it's fine, but if it goes away, that's fine too. We focus first on preserving your dollars. The first rule is don't lose money. The second rule? Don't forget rule one. <laughs> don't forget rule one. And, and then we look for a reasonable return with safety behind it. And, and, and the tax stuff can take care of itself. Um, th there were also some reductions in the marginal tax rates. You're probably familiar with that if you pay attention to it at all, but that will save you even more money when you're filing your tax returns. So that's a brief summary of how it relates to real estate. It's far more complicated than I just made it, but those are the key points. And that's what you can take away is that essentially this year for 2018, if you're in PF3 or another venture and we pay out money or don't pay out money, you're gonna pay less taxes, um, irregardless. So PF3, our run rate overview, my favorite sheet. Um, we look at this all the time to see where are we right now <clears throat> based on current occupancy, debt service. One key element to this that you'll see if I stop here is the net operating income is slightly more than twice the debt service. That's a 2.0 debt service coverage ratio that's called. That's very, very good. That's very high. A bank, which there are some of our bankers here tonight, you can corner them and ask them, but they would like to see at least 1.2 times debt coverage ratio, maybe 1.3. Um, so in essence, our net operating income could drop all the way down to roughly $8 million, and we still would be in conformity with what a bank would loan us money for. Um, that debt service, by the way, is your principal and interest payment. So that's the total amount of payments that you would make or we make um, on the properties in a year. Leaves us cash flow of about $7 million. About $2.75 million is principal pay down. That's, you know, of the $6.7 million in debt service, we're actually reducing debt by about 2.75 million on our current balance of around $84 million. If you're invested in PF3, <clears throat> you shouldn't be nervous about that number because you're not actually on the hook for that money. I am. Um, and when I get up at four o'clock in the morning, I actually don't worry about that because PF3 is solid and I feel very good about the ratios we have. So. Um, Total equity, this is based on a share value of 61,000, which is kind of an arbitrary number at this point because we don't really have shares. We all own a percentage ownership of the portfolio. Cash flow, our seven and a half, what we're distributing right now out of our cash flow is around 5.1 million annually. You're all getting your pro rata share of that if you're in the entity. And we're building reserves at about 1.8 million, although we're not really building those reserves because we're spending that money. That money's going back into parking lots roofs, mechanicals, and things like that. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about uh, what we're encountering in terms of tenant turnover these days. Um, we do have a cash balance of around seven and a half million. And if that number drops below five million, then we would be in a situation where we may want to potentially suspend distributions for a few months and just make sure we had the cash that we needed on hand to deal with the issues we have. I don't foresee that happening, however, that's kind of our worst case scenario. Um, if we do run into things that cost us way more than anticipated. Um, the outlook for the properties remains very strong. Our team works very hard on the properties every single day. Um, we are going to introduce them in a second. And uh, <clears throat> what I wanna talk about here quickly is the future of PF3 before we do that. So the idea was to do the work once and get paid forever. If you invested in PF3, hopefully you haven't done a lot of work and you've been getting paid and that's great. We have been doing a lot of work, so it's not exactly the same for us, but um, it's fun and we get paid for that work too. Um, we are making strategic improvements to properties all the time. And uh, the biggest question I get is always about the liquidity. How do I get my equity back out? 
Now, if you had originally invested in PF3 from the very beginning, you actually have all your money back at this point in time. You've received it in the form of distributions by now. Um, but you still have a substantial amount of money that is in PF3. And so <clears throat> there's a few ways to create liquidity. The first one that I have up there is to try and convert to what's called a real estate investment trust. The problem or challenge with a real estate investment trust is that then you have to conform to certain rules that basically force you to distribute more of your cash flow than we think it's prudent to distribute. Puts you in a position where you may not have the reserves on hand you necessarily need. In addition, it wouldn't be a publicly traded REIT anyway, so there would be no market for it, so it really doesn't help in terms of creating liquidity. We could buy back shares from the reserves. We've looked at that and we thought about creating a, a share buyback program, but what we'd have to do there is suspend distributions anytime someone wanted to redeem shares in order to be able to buy those shares back. We can't actually buy them from the reserves because again, that would leave us cash poor and vulnerable to some kind of problem or challenge. The last one that I have up there is we just sell everything and we liquidate it. And as hard as that is for me to think about doing, that's what we're thinking about doing. Um, it's almost like selling one of my children because it's taken nine years to build this portfolio. And we did represent originally that we would have some type of a liquidity event at the end of 10 years. That's at the end of this year. We're not obligated to do that. However, that's what we said we would do. So what we're doing right now is we've prepared a bunch of packets on the properties and just today they've actually hit markets and gone out to test the waters and see what we can get for the properties. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit in the real estate cycle and why we think that might be a good, this might be a good time to actually test those waters and see that. The great news is we're on an uptick that's not going to go anywhere anytime soon. Our properties are very solid. There's no, there's no forced sale. We're in a very good position to sit back and see what the market will bring us and get ideally full value, if not a premium, for what we've built. <clears throat> this is the ProManas team as it stands, other than we have a lot of people out in the field that um, do things, building engineers, on-site leasing staff. But as far as the office and, and the people I interact with on a daily basis and, and, and a lot of you interact with. Um, this is the team. You may know some of them. Um, if you were here last year, they were all here except for Lisa Treat, who we brought on uh, to head up our, basically all of our marketing and investor communications. She's been doing a fantastic job. Um, Rachel and her basically made this whole thing happen tonight. Um, Jim Barnes is here from Contracting Resources, who's the general contractor on the project and actually did the part about the you know, the, the bricks and this other stuff. But as far as the decorations and the party and this PA system and, and so forth, um, uh, Lisa and Rachel coordinated that. Um, Will St. Ange is new. Uh, many of you have probably spoken to Will. If you've called, he's uh, Director of Investor Relations now. And um, his real name is Brad, <laughs> but we made him change it to Will. Um, <laughs> because we already had a Brad in the office and that would be confusing. Um, and he was a great sport about it. I mean, I, I'm not sure I, I would walk in and say, you're not gonna be John anymore, you know, you're, you're gonna be Eddie. He'd be like, oh, I kinda like Eddie, to be honest with you. I'll, I'll take Eddie. When I, drove, when I drove Domino's pizza delivery trucks, we'd just go in the back and pick a name tag and that's who we were for the day. I always picked Chuck. I loved <laughs> Chuck. Um, Angela Winstrand also, she's the commercial property manager. She's new, um, a rock star along with Carla. They are out in the field and really making sure our tenants are happy, getting renewals done, things like that. Um, and again, we have many others out in the field. So um, a big hand for those guys, all of them. I mean, I... There is zero chance we are anywhere near where we are today without them. Um, so very briefly, we, we, we did a more in-depth video on the real estate cycle. Um, we talked about it a lot on a recent podcast, if you listen to those that go out ever that uh, sometimes we're on. Um, but the important thing here is that line 
that's going up that's crossing 2017 to present that says PF4 above it and where we are approximately in the cycle, at least where I see it. And right now is a great time to sell existing assets, develop new properties, build and get out of things. The challenge is if you get to the apex of that curve and you haven't sold something, I have experience with this because we hit that in 2007 and I had 20 single family homes that I owned and that was fine, they were rented out. Just like PF3, we would be fine, we wouldn't have any problems. However, I was not able to actually sell and liquidate those properties until early 2017, almost 10 years exactly to the day when I was trying to, I was trying to sell them in 2006, but I just couldn't get out of them quickly enough. And so real estate being uh, somewhat illiquid and taking some time to sell, you know, usually a transaction will take at least 90 days, if not 120, and that's a fast transaction um, that you put under, tra uh, under contract relatively quickly. You just gotta be a little bit ahead of it. So is it the perfect time to sell stuff? I don't know if I would say it's the perfect time to sell, but I think sometime in the next two to three years, it's a very good time to exit the types of properties we own in PF3. I'd elaborate on that, but not everybody here has anything to do with PF3, and we will be talking about it with PF3 members on a conference call and in other updates. But it's, um, we have, essentially just for your general knowledge, we have, we don't own downtown core trophy assets in PF3. We own big industrial buildings, you know, a little off the beaten path, we have office buildings that are, they're not class A, they're class B. And when, when the market starts to soften, those ones become harder to sell um, as opposed to, let's say, our hotel in downtown Denver, which probably isn't going to suffer through a downturn like that because people are still traveling, doing business, and need a place to stay. Um, and money seeks security, so it moves inward towards city centers, which is why you'll see in PF4, almost everything we're building is an infill project where we're very confident that supply will not exceed demand for quite some time. Um, a few years ago, I think we brought this up for the first time and started talking about development. Actually, kind of a funny story, I went and looked at the videos from 2016 and um, I started listening to them to find a spot where I started predicting this development cycle and I found it, but I was so annoyed by my own voice and the baldness of my head that I very quickly shut it off and told Brad or Eric to say, hey, go find some quotes in there or something. You guys look at it, I can't even stand it. And, uh, but anyway, it's, just, it's not me, it's you. <laughs> um, anyway, so, you may have seen some of the um, headlines that we've posted around and some articles on some of these easels that we've put out here, the housing crisis. Uh, now they're talking about the housing crisis being a shortage of homes, not an oversupply and foreclosures. This is what I was talking about two years ago. Pent up demand. You can't even fill it. It's insane. All of these articles are written, sorry, in the first quarter of this year. And so what will happen is people will start flooding in to fix this crisis and, and start building things. But there's some major barriers to entry and there's a huge lag on getting product to market. So we're extremely well positioned in PF4 and I think in pretty much any deal we decide to initiate within the next two years at least. Um, you can't see much further, I can't, than maybe three years down the road, three to five, that's about as far as I even consider trying to look down the real estate window. Um, so don't ask me about beyond three to five years, but I can tell you in the next three years, we're gonna have plenty of opportunities to do development if we choose to do that. Um, the developers that we run in out there have very solid deals, a lot of them. Um, they just don't have the cash to do them and they don't have the background and they don't have the track record. And that's how we've positioned ourselves with you as our strength, people that we've made money for before, and we can point to that track record and raise money again 
which um, is surprising, but it's also <laughs> happening. And um, we can then go in and negotiate things that we otherwise wouldn't be able to negotiate. Because if you think about it, if you got a packet sent to you on the internet about some high-rise condo project in Sarasota, Florida, that was going to pay you, you know, some percentage of return, and it all looked good, but you don't know the guy there, you don't know much about Sarasota, you don't know whatever, you know, what's the likelihood that you're going to stroke a check for $250,000 or more and just invest in Sarasota? But if you have somebody that can do that for you and vet those projects, and you know they've looked at 100 to narrow it down to one, that's great. But the developer in Sarasota has that problem. That's the important thing to understand. The developer in Nashville has that problem. The developer in Denver has that problem. And to a certain extent, it's not even that they have that problem. They just don't even want to deal with you. Uh, I mean, investors. And um, not you personally. But they don't want to. It, it's, a, it's, an, it's an incredibly large job to create the private placement memorandum, structure the deal, help get the bank financing, put all the money together, handle the books and accounting, handle all the construction draws. That in and of itself takes our whole team. So if you're somebody who's walking down the street and you go, I think there should be an office building over here, and boy, and they write a contract and get the land under contract, and they put a whole conceptual package together, and they say, well, this is a great deal, now what do I do? Well, they got to bring it to someone like us. It's the only way they can get it done. And there aren't a lot of people like us. So we happen to be in a very good position. Um, so onward past all that stuff. Let's quickly go through PF4. Some of you are probably familiar with this. Some of you are not. Um, this is a, an opportunity. What we do in PF4 is we do exactly what I said. We vet these projects. And we, we capitalize on this situation that exists. PF4 was started last year. Um, our goal for PF4 was to have total investor capital of 30 to $50 million. Uh, we're at 26.8 million right now. If you see the units issued, 268 um, with $100,000 a piece, that's 26.8 million. Uh, we have about 15 available. So the first 15 of you that cut a check for $100,000 tonight can get those last shares. Or one of you can cut a check for 1.5, that's fine too. Um, but uh, no, seriously, we, have, um, we, we, we do have a few shares in PF4. We hope to be able to get one more deal at least into PF4 before it closes on June 30th and issue another four to eight million of shares depending on the deal. We have two that we're evaluating right now. We're just not sure if we're going to be able to get them finalized, done, approved, and out for a vote before June 30th. I think we will. Um, but then PF4 is done, it's closed, it's over with. And those will be the last shares we have available in PF4. PF4, like I said, it closes to all new investments and in capital on June 30th, and then it's designed to finish up, be completed, and pay you all your money back plus your returns within about a three-year time frame from that June 30th date. It's projected at a 15% plus annual rate of return. I'll explain to you how the money comes out if you ever watch this PF3 presentation, it's very similar. Uh, investors invest their money into PF4. PF4 takes that money and then invests it into sub-projects. Uh, the first one's called the Lottie Hotel, and then you can read them going across, and we'll give you a little explanation of those. But essentially what happens is as those deals liquidate and we sell off those projects, the money goes right back into PF4, and then we pay all the money out of PF4 to the investors until they have 100% of their capital returned to them. And then we continue to pay them money until they have an additional 7% annual return on their money paid to them. So if your money was in PF4 for three years, you would get your 100 grand back plus another $21,000 before anything changed, before we took any return ourselves. And then after that, the investors received 90% of the upside and we received 10% of the upside for having constructed the whole thing. So again, whoever's not listening out there, um, well, they were, Brad said it, not me, so I'm not really that offended, but um, that actually doesn't annoy me. See, I don't know why. Um, so we take the proceeds from the sale, we pay off the debt, 
or the company obligations. This is at each entity level, mind you. So the Alati Hotel sells, we pay off all the debts of that, and then that money flows into PF4, and then we return 100% of investor capital. We then pay the preferred return to investors. That 7% is accrued. We dot, you're not getting a monthly check. It's just compounding or accruing, I guess, rather, on your behalf. I'm not even sure if it's compounded or simple interest, but um, you have to look that one up. But it's a 7% preferred return. And then what happens is we then participate uh, in the upside on the profits, and we get a 10% equity stake uh, against the total capital that was raised in PF4. So once we get that 10% catch up, then um, remaining profits are split 90% to investors and 10% to our company. Um, the way this pencils out, the simple uh, math to this is that every single deal that PF4 has invested in shows a return higher than 20% coming back into PF4. Um, we just project a 15% return to the investors across the board because we kind of figured, hey, some might hit, some might not. If any of you guys want to grab seats, um, people can raise their hand if there's a seat next to them. Does anybody want to get a seat? There's a bunch up here, a bunch over here. Feel free to wander in. You won't annoy me. I can barely see you. So um, at any rate, um, that's how it works. I'm happy to answer more questions on it. We have full packets on this. If you're interested, we can get you those. And we also think this structure su substantially limits uh, the downside risk. One, because there's no dilution to the investor at all until they get their money back plus 7%. That's very, very rare. That's not a normal structure in the real estate world. You typically will see deal sponsors getting paid whether or not you get paid or not. We keep the management fee and anything like that to the absolute bare bones minimum. Um, we don't bill things to the project. We wanna make sure we get the investor capital back first and we're willing to bet and gamble that we're right and that we'll get paid in the end. Um, it's kind of ironic because when I structure these things, I'm always so paranoid about losing money that I structure them in such a way that it never looks like, I'm like, man, this is crazy. You know, it's just isn't even fair to, to us and our team. And, and then um, when it starts to work, I'm like, holy cow, you know, <laughs> we really didn't have to do it this way at all. I mean, you know, it's like all these deals are working, they're making sense. I just, you know, I, don't know. I think it's lack of confidence um, up front. It always looks scary on paper. But when you start seeing the buildings go up and you start seeing people signing leases and you start seeing people buying the units you're building, it's just very exciting and, uh, and fun. So PF4 has the Element Hotel. That's the first one. Uh, it's a 157-room hotel. Um, we've had an offer for somebody to buy it already before it's completed, but they, um, they, they typically are looking for a discount over your completed price. So we've decided we're going to wait because the market in Denver is still on a ridiculous trajectory, and um, we feel like we'll do better waiting. Um, observatory Flats, this is a 52-unit condo development right at Denver University campus. We just started construction on this in the fall of 2017. We expect completion on this in the first quarter of 2020. Um, oh, sorry, this one is uh, late 2019. So actually what's interesting about this is the, uh, the fund's gonna close on June 30th and we may be returning capital as early as one and a half years from June 30th, uh, based on how these projects are going. Um, they're, they're moving actually on pace with what was represented to us, which is not normal. So we, we put longer time frames on them. But um, anyway, that's uh, Jefferson Park. This is very similar, again, in Denver. Different neighborhood. This is closer to the football stadium. Really nice area, great building and everything is on track with this. We're just demoing the existing structures right now and construction will start next month. Um, there is an issue with some of these projects on pre-sales. We'll talk about it at the end of this slide, but um, this is Hawkins. This is the most recent addition to PF4. Um, Meg Epstein from California South Development is here tonight. If you get a chance to meet her, 
This is her project. She's in Nashville. And um, we have, like I said, two others that we're working on with her right now. Um, see if we can get at least one of them added into PF4. Um, tremendous team that she has down there. Where'd we get this photo, by the way? I kind of like the old one. We have a great architect down there, Jared, and he sent this photo, this rendering of this project from the other side of the building, which showed the pool. And it had all these, like, you know, dudes out there in board shorts and these women in little thong bikinis. And as, anyway, if you find that offensive, again, it's not me. Um, <laughs> but it's funny, he's a riot. Um, so the biggest challenge with all of these projects are what are called pre-sales. And a pre-sale means you have this project, you have a piece of paper, you have a rendering, you have a pretty picture and a floor plan, and you try and take it out to market and get somebody to buy that unit before you've even put a shovel in the ground. That's very, very difficult to do in any project anywhere. People just don't, if they're gonna do it, they want a discount. I mean, why would you? Why would you not, why, you know, unless you are so speculative that you think the market's gonna go crazy, in which case you're more of a speculator or investor than you are an actual owner of a unit. Or if the market's so tight, you might get some, like we did in the Sarasota project uh, and the Kingsley project here in Ann Arbor. But really, for the most part, People aren't gonna buy units until you get the building at least framed in. This creates another great opportunity for us, a couple opportunities. One, it keeps other people from entering the market because banks require pre-sales because they're scared. They're fearful that the project will get done and they will end up with a project that is vacant and empty. I'm not really worried about that. I gotta be honest with you, I'm not worried about it at all because we're putting 30% down and if the project got done and we couldn't sell it, we would just put 20% more down and we'd rent the units out and wait until the market rebounded. If you think about this as we are creating a product that is necessary, that is in demand, and we are not gouging people for it, then you're thinking about it correctly. That's what real estate development is. And it's not something other people can compete with. It's not a widget that somebody else can go open up a shop down the street and start producing widgets. It takes an architect, an engineer. It takes years of planning to get these projects to where they are where we can put a shovel in the ground, and you have to have the foresight to be ahead of the market. So other people, this fear that you have of these pre-sales creates a situation where other people cannot get financing for their projects or, or they have to discount the project so much that they start to not make sense. They have to discount the units substantially to get their pre-sales. So we have a few ways around this. Bankers, plug your ears. Um, but the, the costliness of those pre-sales is what we're trying to avoid um, when we want to focus on the opportunity that this is creating. And what we've done is we've done two things. One, we found private lenders who don't, aren't, they're not under the same regulatory scrutiny as the banks are and their loans aren't looked at every couple days. And so they're just giant family foundations, teachers' pension funds. There's a, is it Chilean, Brad? Yeah. Uh, Altus? Just Chilean something or other groups that just say, oh, if you're putting 20% of your own cash in or 30% of your own cash in, here you go. We'll loan you 70. We don't care about pre-sales. We don't, we don't care about anything. We'd love to take your project back if we can at 70 cents on the dollar. And which of course they won't, but it's, um, it's a way to get around it. The loans are a little more expensive up front, but not as expensive as it is to give away discounts on pre-sales or as much time as it will cost you to get those pre-sales. Plus, if you sign someone up to buy a unit and then you don't put a shovel in the ground for six months, there's a likelihood they get discouraged and walk off and leave. Um, plus, if it takes two years to build the project, a lot can change in two and a half years. So pre-sales we don't really care for. Um, the other way that we are addressing this is what's called a mezzanine loan piece. So we're going to banks and we're saying, hey, how about we do this condo project, which is going to cost, say, $20 million, and we'll put $10 million up, and you just be there to put the other $10 million up. And most banks will say, absolutely. We don't need any pre-sales at 50 cents. We'll do it. You know, our 50% loan to cost, that's not even loan to value. The value of the project is probably 25 or 30 million. So their leverage on that is so low that the banks are willing to say, 
we'll loan you the money. So that's where we'll have opportunities that you will see that are called mezzanine loan pieces. And we will send those out to everybody and they can participate in those as they see fit. But essentially what we do with that $20 million project is we raise the $6 million of equity. Let's say that's gonna go in PF4 or some other entity. That's the $6 million, call it high risk capital. It's the first to get wiped out. Um, then we create a 20% mezzanine piece. So that in this case would be $4 million. And we may pay an interest rate of six, seven, eight percent on that money directly to the investors. So if you had an IRA or a 401k and you were like, or cash rattling around and you're like, hey, I can commit to loan you money for, uh, you know, 18 months or 12 months at an 8% interest rate. Certainly the banks aren't paying me that. I can't even get that in a CD or virtually anywhere else. Um, so with this kind of safety, those are, those are options we're looking at, and those are things we've created in the past and, and things we'll create again. Um, again, moving on, you'll see that. We'll send some info out on those as well if you're interested in those projects. The most important thing, if you're considering investing with us, is just letting us know what you're interested in. We keep a master spreadsheet, and we kind of you know, say, all right, well, you know, here we have this opportunity. Here's a, here's a guy who's always interested. We have one guy who's just always interested in the mezzanine loan piece. That's all he wants to do and he'll do up to $10 million, and he just loves it because he's like, hey, I can't possibly lose money. You're not gonna walk away from $3 million, or $6 million, let's say, you know, because you owe me my four. And he's right, we're not. And, and especially when the project built out is worth 30 million. It's just a, it's a very low uh, risk proposition to get, I would say it equates to like, what you should get is about a four or 5% return, you're getting eight. Not a big spread, but over the course of a lifetime, it adds up. A couple other projects very quickly. Kingsley, I've mentioned it. That's downtown Ann Arbor. Um, this is a real picture. The framing on the second floor is nearing completion. It's a total of five floors with a rooftop deck, a really nice amenity space. Um, nice place to go up and smoke cigars if your wife doesn't want you to do it in the house. And um, we have 21 units sold there. Uh, with firm purchase agreements, 10% non-refundable deposits, and eight units currently reserved. And that project's going just as we had hoped it would. And the next one, Boulevard Sarasota, you may have seen this recently. It's kind of a funny story as to how we secured an 18% preferred return to our investors on this deal. That was basically, again, my, me being paranoid that I wouldn't be able to raise $16 million in the time needed. So I told the developer I needed an 18% pref for my investors, or there's just no way I can raise that kind of money. And to be honest with you, I didn't think we'd raise that kind of money in the six weeks we had to do it anyway. I mean, I, I had a backup guy who was gonna give me 8 million uh, of the 16 if, if we fell short. And so um, by the time he called me back to offer up his 8 million and said, what percentage of it do you need? Uh, we were one week out. Uh, and we had funded the whole 16 million. Um, so apparently, people are pretty happy with an 18% preferred rate of return on a deal like this. Um, the, the, the best part of this project was they actually had the pre-sales. They had $46 million of this project pre-sold with non-refundable 20% deposits. And um, so to us, it was kind of a no-brainer um, because we know how hard it is to get those uh, pre-sales. And so it was just indicative that that market there really can warrant uh, a project like this. Um, so before we get to questions, one last slide that um, kind of explains what we're trying to do, I guess. Um, a lot of people talk about asset allocation, um, what that means. Um, this is a chart that shows the difference in returns between the top and bottom quartile managers in various industries. So if you're looking at bonds, uh, it's not really terribly important whether you have a really good bond manager or a really bad bond manager because they don't differ very much. If you're out there taking wild bets on bonds and you're getting 12% returns, there's probably something wrong. Um, as you get to equities, um, there isn't that much of a variation in equity advisors either, to be honest with you. Um, it, it's, you know, it's just not a widespread, if you ask me. I mean, 
1.9% makes a big difference if you compound it over 40 years. But the same thing uh, when, you, when you start getting into international equity, these markets start becoming a little less efficient. And where you have inefficiencies, the people make more of a difference than where you have very good efficiencies. Um, as you get to real estate, which coincidentally is in about the middle of the spectrum, I've always liked to be kind of in the middle of everything, um, bring people together and socialize and stuff like that. Um, but real estate fits kind of right in the middle. And 9.2% difference between a really good real estate manager and investment manager and a you know, kind of low-end real estate investment manager is, is massive, obviously. But I can tell you that really good real estate investment managers will get you somewhere in the neighborhood of a 10 to 12% rate of return on your money consistently over a long period of time. That's kind of the, the, the gold standard of, of real estate is to be in that 10 to 12% range. And so if the bottom level is 9.2, it means you're really not making anything or perhaps you're losing some money on some deals. Um, and the, if you're into leverage buyouts, it gets wider and venture capital, it goes through the roof. So I'm not really interested in taking bets that go a thousand times or zero. Um, so it's not a space that we typically get into. Although I did recently make a small investment in a startup company called Forever Labs. You may have seen me post something on this. It's a stem cell uh, storage company. They actually draw your stem cells out of your, out of your bone and then they cryogenically preserve them for you. Um, it's not as painful as it sounds. It actually wasn't painful at all. It was kind of fun. You get to take a Valium and um, a Vicodin and I think there was one other, but I don't think that was actually prescribed. Um, so the thing is, you know, we talk about, you, I have a, uh, I kind of wanted to have this done so I could give everybody a copy of it here, but I have a book coming out that talks about this uh, concept and about finding a good real estate investment manager. And um, it'll be done someday and you'll get one, we'll send it to you anyway. But um, the, I, the whole point of it is to spend less time and energy attempting to beat markets and spending more time and energy attempting to find the best managers in in various asset classes, especially the alternative asset classes. Um, we want to be that for you. We want to be a top real estate investment manager for you. Um, we want you to be comfortable in allocating a good portion of your capital to the same place that I put my capital and all of us in our office put our capital. And uh, again, we greatly appreciate it. And I thank you all for being here. And I will uh, open it up to Questions, if anybody has any question. What was the difference between the run rate of uh, 2017 and your 2018 run rate, which was lower? Uh, the difference between 2017 and 2018 run rate, um, it's a number of things. One, on our run rate, we kind of dumbed down the numbers a little bit. Um, so our actual performance almost always beats our run rate. Um, we also have one tenant that just spun out of a building, um, uh, Celine South State. I think that represented about a hundred and something. We have, um, we have Sprint leaving a building, which changes the run rate substantially. Um, however, they're on the hook for their lease through the end of this year, and it's likely we'd re-tenant the building before then, but we just take it off right away. So. In a lot of cases, that run rate spreadsheet is really an internal sheet we look at mostly, and we always try and make it look bad. Um, I hope that answers the question, but that's the main point. It's not really a fundamental change in discounting rents or anything else. Um, it's just a matter of if we have a tenant leave or coming vacant, we don't plug another one in at the same number and assume they're going to be there. We just wait until that happens and then adjust it at that time. Again, I can't see good question, Scott. John, this question may be premature, but I wondered about the three to five year plan in terms of liquidating PF3. So, yeah, PF3, um, I mean, 
it could, we could be start selling properties in the next, we have actually one property in PF3 that is under contract for sale right now um, called 101 Woodman. It's in Dayton, Ohio, and it's just kind of an outlier to the portfolio. Um, I, I think we bought it for around two, five, um, and we have it under contract to sell it for 2.9 million. We've made good money on it. It's a fine property, but it's occupied by a call center company, and I don't know if you've seen the, what Google's coming out with lately, but the AI uh, stuff that they have, um, the automated systems that they can come up with that sound so real, I, we just kind of look at it and go, man, we just don't think call centers are gonna be there, and there just isn't another use for this building. It just sort of sits out there by itself. So the outliers, we've already kind of started putting out there and trying to, to, to liquidate. The, the main um, core assets of the portfolio we're putting out right now, and John, that could happen two months. Um, if we don't get something done on these properties sometime in the next three months, if, if something doesn't come in that's you know, really good, then we just pull them off the market and kind of look at it again next spring. It's always better to sell in the spring. That's just the way real estate is. Always better to sell in the spring. If you can always wait to put your house on the market until May, you're gonna do way better than if you're trying to sell it at any other time of the year. Same thing with commercial for some reason. It's just like people wake up and decide, hey, it's time to do something again. Um, sometimes right at the end of the year is a good time as well, actually. Um, a lot of people are trying to get things uh, in under the radar. There's also this situation that exists right now where people are selling assets and they're subject to uh, quite substantial taxes on a capital gain and they're trying to complete a 1031 exchange and they have nowhere to go and they will pay you way more than the value of your properties just to avoid paying the taxes to the government which to me is kind of dumb but it's good for us if we're selling assets hope that answers the question uh, two questions John um, first thing on the mezzanine financing how does that affect the returns for the ordinary investors mm -hmm. and the second question is in the slides, when you talk about com project completion with PF4, you mean actually liquidating the assets and returning funds to the investors, or you're not talking about the development, the construction portion of the project when you talk about project completion? Okay, I think I got both of those. So the first one, the mezzanine loan pieces that we create do not negatively affect the return of the deal we may be paying a slightly higher interest rate to our own private investors on those mezzanine loans than we would to a bank, but we're not giving up about twice that much money on, like if you think of the spread between the two, if we're borrowing from a bank at 5% and we pay our own investors 7 or 8%, the difference in cost is 2 or 3% on let's say $4 million for a period of one year. It's, it's really not, it doesn't even, make much of a difference at all. And banks charge points. There's also legal fees, attorney's fees, other things. So it's kind of a wash there. But more importantly, it actually juices the return to the investors on the equity side because, again, we don't have to go sell 15 units and give you know $50,000 discounts per unit, which is what you have to do. When I mean, you're talking about 50 grand per unit to get a presale on 15 units, that's $750,000. And if you do the math, what's a three-point spread on $4 million for a year? That's 120,000 bucks. I'd rather give the money to the guys you know, and, and, and let the return come out the end. The second question, when we talk about project completion, we expect all of these to be sold by the time the project's complete. There may be a few stragglers along the way, but all the condo projects we think will be 100% sold out and finishing. So when we say project completion date of spring, you might have a three month lag till we have all our money out and we're done and we can you know, start distributing that cash out if that answers that question. The only one that's not like that is the Element Hotel where we may get it complete and we, we will likely have enough pre-bookings in the hotel to be able to show a future earning statement of what it will make but we, we won't have a track record. So ideally, we'd, the ideal way to do that would be to get it complete, hold it for one year and then sell it. Um, it would also allow for a capital gains tax treatment, which would be much better than ordinary income. Does that answer that question? 
Okay, wasn't sure if I got that one. Hey, John. Um, uh, so when I look at the real estate market right now, I'm seeing three dynamics going on. One you talked about, which is the uh, uh, severe uh, constraint that we have with respect to supply. Then uh, we're seeing uh, labor shortages. I read about that in the journal all day long. Um, and then uh, along with that, the raw material prices are going up as well. And the third is the interest rates now moving up and maybe accelerating. Um, when I look at uh, the housing stocks, they are off 15% uh, this year. So with all those dynamics in play, it seems like, at least from a Wall Street perspective, we may be peaking. Would love to hear more about your thoughts on that. I don't see that myself, but you know, with Nashville and Denver and Ann Arbor, we're, we're seeing still acceleration in some cases. So what are your thoughts? Well, one, <clears throat> I don't know anything about a housing stock. Um, I, I, those are valued based on whatever sentiments. They don't often tie into earnings. It's real speculative. Um, you are correct that there is a log jam, and that log jam is things are so expensive. You know, even if we build a house, can we sell it? And you know, is there enough pressure to cause people to pay, get out of their comfort zone and pay $350,000 for a 700 square foot condominium? Um, we're only going into places where we feel 95%, 98% confident that we're going to be just fine and be able to do that. We're actually trying to stay at price points that will allow us to be far more competitive um, and, and meet those needs. As far as the, the, the material pricing, um, it kind of is what it is. You know, I, I, um, I will say I, I bought a cup of uh, iced tea um, earlier this week at, um, and uh, I was like, hey, do you have iced tea? Yeah, sure, I have an iced tea. And they said, that'll be 275. And I was like, for what? You know, like, a, I mean, a cup of iced tea? I was like, that's insane, you know? And, 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 and we used to spend 10 cents on a cup of coffee or it was free everywhere you went. And now it's, you know, five bucks for your mocha, latte, something or other, whatever, you know? So um, there's, a, there's a fundamental shift in, in, in um, you know, I, I, I think like you and I, I, I fight it every day, um, but there's a fundamental shift in, in what people are willing to spend money on and, and the, the, the younger people that want to live in the cities and the baby boomers um, who are empty nesters now that want to have walkability and live close to things, you know, it, it's, uh, it's creating a situation where we can do, I think, very, very well. I, I do keep an eye on some of the macro stuff you're bringing up. I just don't pay attention to it too closely because it's kind of beyond my control. I was always worried there'd be this like lockup where all of a sudden it's like, wow, it's going to cost $2 million to build a starter home and nobody can afford that. But then what happens is, all the prices of the existing homes go up. So when you look at like our Sarasota project, where people, I mean, the average price of a unit in Sarasota high rise is like $2.6 million. And I'm like, who the heck is gonna buy a unit for $2.6 million? And we started looking down all the contracts on the pre-sales, and they're all people that own places now that they're gonna sell for $1.6 million. They're just moving up. And the person that was 800,000 is buying the one for one six, and the 400,000 is moving to the 800, and now there's a starter uh, retirement beachfront place available for you know 1.6, not you know whatever. So it, it there's two different ways that you can think about it. The first one that everybody thinks about, and I used to think about, was oh boy, there's this housing crisis, and there's all these people that can't afford homes. We got to create all these starter homes that are affordable. That's backwards. What we have to do is create a whole bunch of product that will sell. And the people buying that product are moving from other places, and those other places are going to create the more affordability to it. That's how I kind of answer that. Ann Arbor's done this backwards forever. They try and, you know, force you into affordable housing situations. And I'm like, why don't you just let developers run wild? Believe me, in a couple of years, you'll have some pretty affordable housing. If you just let people build everything all over the place, guess what? We'll be oversupplied, and prices will come down because they have to. That's just how it works. Supply demand. What else? Anybody else? Got one over here. I can't see. A great presentation. Thank you. Um, what's the 
deal concentration risk limitation, or if you have any, uh, per project? By deal concentration risk, define what you mean by that. Percentage of the total fund in any single given project. Got it. Um, so in PF4, you know, we really wanted six to eight deals into PF4, but it took longer to put them together than we would have hoped. And so we're going to end up with probably five. Um, the hotel's obviously bigger than the others, but not substantially. We, we didn't want to have more than 10 million of equity in any one. So, you know, you'd think, um, you know, we're probably a little overweighted on the hotel, but we certainly like it. Um, the, the fund structure, I would say, was created as a way, um, this happened with PF3 also. It is a diversification strategy for the investor to be across five deals as opposed to one. What we found out is that most of our investors would rather just pick one and be in one. But really what it does is it creates an efficiency on our end because we have 300 people in PF3 and we probably have 200 already in PF4 and we send one update per month. Whereas if we had you know, to send five and in PF3 we'd have to send 25, so now you're talking about 30 updates to 30 different groups of owners. Um, the other thing that it does is it allows us to pool um, development fees, management fees, overages, uh, and create a layer of protection. Because if I have five different entities, and this one over here has got a $100,000 budget overrun, and we don't have the money for it, you know, mm, I can't really, you know, what am I going to do? I want to send a letter to those 50 people and say, hey, everybody's got to put in 100 bucks so we can meet this overage. Whereas if we have it in this pool of things, we, our office has enough internally and whatever to just say, you know what, let's just loan, let's not even bother anybody. We'll just loan that to the project. It's a cost overrun. We're making it up on sales prices anyway. But it gives us an efficiency of reporting. Um, it gives us the ability to kind of pool funds in a way. And that allows us to allow more cash to go out to the members. I don't have to hire, I mean, I, the staff I'd have to have if we did these all as one-offs would be triple what we have right now, easily triple. I mean, it's enough to report on what we have, but if we broke it all up, it would be a complete nightmare. And some of the deals we have in PF3 would be rotten. Uh, two of them in particular, we'd be calling people for money because they're just terrible deals. One of them we're trying to give back to the bank. We're like, just get rid of it. It's not instrumental to the portfolio, but if it stood by itself and you were in it, it would matter to you and it would matter to my mom and it would matter to my Aunt Barb and whoever else was in that particular one. Um, so that was really the reason for putting that strategy together was we just, we just knew we couldn't be right 100% of the time. Um, we may be right 100% on the development deals. Right now it certainly feels and looks that way, but you never know until you get to the end. And I would just hope that anyone that kind of you know, lagged a little, we'd more than make up for it with the others, which we've certainly done in PF3. Just one other thing on, in terms of PF, is there going to be a PF5 if you miss the deadline for investing in PF4 by June 30? We don't know. Um, we've been talking about that a lot lately. We're thinking about just closing up PF4, finishing it, seeing how those projects go, taking a couple months off, and, and, um, and just kind of, you know, focusing on what we have. Plus, if we get into offers flying on PF3, that's going to take a tremendous amount of time and energy to field and negotiate those and deal with all of that stuff. Um, and we're pretty uh, swamped right now with our current workload. So that's another compelling reason to kind of say, hey, you know, if we got rid of these weeds over here, not PF3 is not a weed, but if we got rid of, we have a few others that are, and we've been getting rid of those. Um, all of them are under contract. It's just a matter of getting them to closing. But as we kind of clean those out, we'll have more time to vet and look at more opportunities. Um, if you know me a little bit longer, then you would know, yes, we will have a lot more opportunities and it'll be a PF5 or some, some kind of a deal junkie and I just love doing it. Um, but, but we want to be very careful, you know, not just do deals to do deals. So um, the, the way this Sarasota thing went was so surprising to me that we might we might look at deals individually on, under certain circumstances, we will do individual deals. Um, we also have um, two major endowment funds that have approached us. 
about running some money for them. And, you know, I have mixed feelings about that because they're going to want me to wear a suit and tie and, you know, this is about as good as it gets right here. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, they're going to want us to put our, our, our uh, I mean, the information they've already asked for is kind of like absurd. And we're like, yeah, we just don't want to like put, take all our information and jam it all into your forms so your little Harvard MBA guy can review it all and then tell us what's wrong with what we're doing. And um, you know, it's just another bottleneck and a layer. So we've kind of steered clear of that. Um, and plus, I, I really think um, you know, the big family offices and the endowment funds and places like that, they, they know what they're doing. And we don't really provide them with much of a value other than access to the deal. The value that we think we provide to the poor rich person, um, which is what I call myself and all of you, uh, the poor rich people, is that you know, we're actually doing something that you can't have access to unless you have you know, hundreds of millions of dollars and can hire a whole team of you know, MBAs, which I don't have, by the way, so just full disclosure, uh, no advanced degrees or anything. Um, any other questions from anybody? I know everyone's probably getting thirsty. I am. So, yes, yeah, Scott. The last one. That's all right. You're good. You talk about CapEx and PF3 yeah. Yeah, going up. What, what has it been and what are you anticipating it being annually? The CapEx? Well, we're, I mean, we have one parking lot right now that's costing us $500,000. We have another building where we have to replace all the bathrooms and the plumbing just because they're that old. And it's $40,000 to replace uh, the bathrooms of men and women's on one floor. And it's a seven-story building. So that's $280,000. We have uh, a roof we're replacing right now to the tune of, I mean, we're doing it in phases. But that costs us probably two, dollars $300,000 a year just for that. Um, and these aren't necessarily things that add to our bottom line. These are things that we just have to do. Um, the, the, we also have a ton of expenses in tenant improvements. And, and so every time a tenant leaves a building, you know, in order to get a new tenant in, you've got to refresh the space or redo it. And that can cost you $25 a square foot. Hey, no big deal if you're building out a 2,000 square foot space. But if you're doing 40,000 square feet, you know, those are huge numbers. If we get, if we get big enough ones, we'll, we'll take it to a bank and borrow to do some of that. Um, right now, everything's manageable from the reserves, and most owners would um, borrow for um, some capex and things like that. We're just, again, very conservative on how we do that. We'd like to just pay cash and see, always see debt go down, um, and and that's just uh, unfortunately our kind of preservation of capital mindset that probably limits us from maybe getting a few extra dollars every month. I'd rather, you know, make sure we can plow back in the billions. But those are the types of things. Um, you know, mechanicals, roofs, and parking lots are probably the big ones that don't really add a lot to the bottom line, but you have to do them. And you just can't, you know, have a tenant getting a leak every time it rains in their ceiling and, you know, ruin, ruining their stuff. Um, and our portfolio is older. I mean, you know, we bought buildings that were 20, 30 years old. And, um, but... We've had a lot of appreciation and run-up in the values as well. So when I talk about sale of PF3, no one's asked, but I'm sure someone's thinking about it. You know, we currently have a share value of 61,000. You know, if we were to sell it at any meaningful number, you know, the, the, the distribution out to the investors would be more in the 75 to 85,000 range on a, on, a, on a fairly conservative estimate. So there would be a big kick up over what you probably have this on your books for um, if we were to exit. Um, it, it wouldn't probably be all at once. It would be, oh, boom, we sold this portion. Here's, you know, 30 grand for your, for your original share. And we sort of shrink distributions a little bit and then charge on. And, oh, here's another one, boom. But in aggregate, the way we evaluate it, um, you know, we, we, we're not going to, I personally don't want to sell my shares at anything less than 75. Um, otherwise, I'm just happy getting a monthly check. I over-answered that question, didn't I? Yeah, I did. That was me, not you. <laughs>
Anybody else? Any questions? Well, listen, thanks again for coming. Here's the important part from this point on. This is the first year we've tried to turn this into a party, and a lot of people just saw Investor Summit and said, I'm not going to that. You know, I, I want to hear John Bogdasarian pontificate on the, the morals of our values in real estate investing. No, the idea was to make this as a way, you know, we could, we could pay for all this with pre-tax dollars. Um, not, not your dollars, our dollars, but we also wanted to kind of show off this building and get the word out on this building. We've, we've got a couple of leases signed on it already, and we have a couple of big users looking at uh, bigger chunks. We're excited about it, but we really want to get this thing full by the end of the year. And um, so your assignment is to go have a great time, whoop it up, have a lot of fun, and then tell a bunch of people what they missed out on. So uh, stay late if you like. Take an Uber if you need one. And uh, thanks for coming. Appreciate it. <laughs>